thanks to, to Rich for that incredibly generous uh, introduction, which is going to be hard to live up to. Uh, and thanks also to another Rich in the room for co-organizing this, this event, which has been, seems to have been in the making for almost two years, maybe, or 18 months. But we first made contact a while ago, and it's just really, really delighted to be here. My first time in Pittsburgh. Very exciting indeed. Uh, I've been loads to New York City, but, you know, um, it gets tired. Well, no, it's not tiring to go to New York City. But it's really good to actually come to other places. I'm discovering that more and more. And, you know, as we'll sort of talk about a bit today, New York City has also changed. Uh, and also thanks to Lauren, who I know is somewhere sitting here for also kind of joining in this venture and putting on the event tonight. I really love it when... Um, <sighs> which is part of the writing project as well, I guess, but it's also a life project. You know, this, the, the kind of the culture that we love and that some of us write about isn't something that just occupies a kind of rarefied intellectual realm, but kind of reaches a wider audience, but then also reaches areas where it can kind of find new incarnations and come to life. So, you know, this, this, is, this might be, I don't know, it might be the 60th book event I've done since the new book came out. There's been a really, a really encouraging response to it. And, uh, and there's, it's really wonderful when we can kind of, when it's possible to participate in events that kind of have several stages to them and, and bring everything together. So I'm just very happy to be here. Um, I'm slightly jet lagged and sl slightly all over the place, but I'll try and hold this all together. So that's the, uh, yeah, take a look at this while it can. The book cover's going to change. That's a long story, <laughs> which I won't go into now. Just a tiny bit of a change. Um, so let me do one other thing, which is get the stopwatch going. So the, this book, as, as you can see, uh, is supposed to cover the, well, it does cover the 1980 to 83 period. Uh, and it's not a period that um, um, gets talked about a, a great deal. And it's not a period that I thought I would write a great deal about. Um, when I set out to write this book, as Rich kind of generously kind of commented, I'd written a book on the 1970s. That book, just to mention very briefly, wasn't supposed to be a book about the 1970s. It was supposed to be a book about the rise of house music uh, out of primarily Chicago, but then also sh uh, bringing in New York City and with parallel developments in Detroit and running, th uh, carrying through uh, the development of that culture, in particular as it kind of got a, you know, a wildfire take up in Europe and in particular the UK uh, around 1988 and kind of and carried on to kind of develop uh, from that point onwards to the point where by the early to mid 1990s it was almost as though US dance culture was happening more in Europe than was happening in, in the United States arguably. Uh, that was what the first book was supposed to be about, um, but very early on into the research, I was introduced to a guy called David Mancuso, who I'd barely heard of at the time. Um, and uh, I met up with David, and um, we, we did our, the first of what were many, many interviews, lasted for three hours. And he made the argument that the history shouldn't start in mid-80s Chicago and New York City, but should start in uh, effectively Valentine's Day 1970 in New York City which is when David held a, his, a, a kind of the first party that would go on to be known as a loft. Uh, and I went back to this period in the end kicking and screaming because I was considered myself to be a child of, I guess we could say, the house music revolution maybe, um, and thought that 70s was kind of full of cheesy disco music and Saturday Night Fever and Studio 54. Um, but before I knew it, um, I'd written... 180,000 words and uh, 500 pages on just the 1970s alone. So enthralled and intrigued by was I by this kind of story of, of um, for want of a much better term, well, maybe we could say subterranean disco. It was even really pre-disco, kind of where DJ culture started to take root in New York City. Um, and so this became the first book, really, this kind of uh, fairly deep and involved um, exploration of a culture that had never really been a thought of before, and in effect uh, attempted to give new kind of credibility to a culture that had become discredited in the national eyes, in particular in the United States, this culture of, of disco. Um, I, I'm not going to refer particularly to the second book, except, except to say that the guy who is the kind of hero, if you like, of, of the second book, Arthur Russell, a composer, songwriter, musician, instrumentalist, uh, and general mutant uh, wanderer, hybrid wanderer of New York City, in a sense kind of um, became the spirit of this new book because Arthur, I was interested in writing, and I, have, I was saying yesterday, I have no particular interest in, in biographical works because I'm interested in scenes, not in biography. 
Um, but the thing that drew me to Arthur Russell was his own lack of commitment, in a sense, to his own musical career, at least in a, what we might call a strategic way or even maybe a cynical way. Uh, instead, Arthur continually followed the music. And what happened when he followed the music in, in his own experience is that he became this kind of emblematic figure that through his wanderings around the different scenes of New York City came to almost capture or, or embody the dynam dynamic range of music that was hap exploding really in New York City during the 1970s and 1980s to the point where we could almost say um, that if we look back on the 1970s and early 1980s and we look at the music that came through during that period, we look at uh, disco and DJ culture, um, dance music culture in its, in its kind of current form, we look at punk music, uh, we look at the rise of rap and hip hop culture. In, in many ways, these, these sounds all broke through, well, in, in every way really, these sounds kind of, well, maybe in many ways, these sounds broke through in New York City in the 70s uh, and early 1980s, and we're still living with the consequences today. Um, these are, the, are, in many ways, the sounds that still define the musical landscape. So something was going on in New York City during the 1970s and early 1980s that was exceptional. And Arthur Russell, the, the guy uh, who I write about in the second book, was the figure who almost kind of said, you know, was interested in dance music. He was primarily a composer when he arrived in the city, but through his movements was able to kind of capture um, in his musical relationships what, this, what was going on in the, in the city during this extraordinary period. And so I came onto the, this book, um, well, the book that became Life and Death on the New York Dance Floor, um, still owing my editor, um, a very patient editor indeed, uh, this book on the history of house music, also taking into account the rise of, of techno and uh, what would come to be known as garage music uh, in, in New York City. And so I set out to write this book. Uh, that was going to really be fo covering the 1980s, but focusing on the second half of the 1980s, which is when these sounds came through. Uh, house music, for example, was first recorded in Chicago in 1984. Again, you can, <laughs> it, it, you don't have to. It doesn't take too long to work out that I didn't. I never made it to the thing that I was supposed to be writing about. And the reason I never made it is because of what I sort of stumbled into effectively during the early 1980s, um, which was a period of an extraordinarily uh, prolific uh, musical and broader cultural production that had started to gather pace during the 1970s, um, but somehow, in, in quite complex ways, seems to, seem to reach its kind of peak of production and creativity during the early 1980s. Um, it got to the point where Anne Magnuson, the owner, uh, well, not the owner, sorry, the, the manager, one of the managers at Club 57, one of the key venues of the period, um, said in one of, the, one of the interviews I conducted with her that living in New York City during the early 90s was like, go, was like experiencing Halloween every night. Uh, it was as if kind of every, every night was a kind of a particularly kind of, you know, if not one, then several key events were happening in the city. I might get on, but maybe not, because there's always so much to kind of try and communicate in, this, in these, these talks. Um, I might get on to the point of, of talking about the way that New York City tends to be represented. I mean, overwhelmingly, in fact, um, in the media, journalism, um, as a place of dysfunctionality, of um, poverty, um, and of extreme danger during the 1970s and early 1980s. In other words, the last place you would want to go to during this period was New York City. And I suppose in a way that wasn't particularly self-conscious, but I've now become reasonably conscious, more conscious about, um, is to really try and develop a series of kind of, in, you know, fairly deep historical explorations that counter this view of New York City as being this kind of place of ruin during the 1970s and early 1980s. Part of my, part of the uh, emerging argument is that it's characterized in this way for quite strategic, uh, political and economic reasons. Um, it was through, partly through making this case that New York City was, was so dangerous a need of repair that we got to see neoliberalism born, um, you know, arguably beginning in the bailout of the city in, well, I say the bailout of the city in 1975. President Ford refused to bail out the city in 1975, and it was at that point um, that the city needed to turn to the banks in order to get loans, in order to kind of keep the city turning over. David Harvey, the, his, uh, the author of A Short History of Neoliberalism, cites this as the beginning of neoliberalism. It was the point when effectively public policy got to be uh, largely, maybe even predominantly decided 
not by uh, democratically elected politicians, but instead by unelected banking officials and institutions. They started to dis make the key decisions around New York City policy for, uh, in 1975 and onwards. And it was the ongoing, I mean, Ford at this point had no interest in, in bailing out the city, which, which was seen as kind of the dark underbelly, the kind of the unconscious, the wild unconscious, if you like, the very heavily racialized uh, unconscious as well of the United States. So Ford wasn't interested in saving city, saving the city. And it was this, o this ongoing, and it's, it's kind of gone on for decades now, representation of New York City in the 70s and 80s as a, as a, as a dysfunctional failing city that has enabled it to be rebuilt in, a, in effectively a corporate image. And so partly what I'm trying to do, and so, okay, this is my first little <laughs> tangent, is that in speaking to people like Anne Magnuson, uh, the, pers the, the Club 57 manager who said it was like living in New York City was like experiencing Halloween every night. Rather than the 500 or so people I've now interviewed during the course of these three books saying that they couldn't stand living in the city, that it was dangerous, that they had no money, that it was awful, you know, I would say that of the 500 people I've interviewed, not one has spoken in those terms about living in the city. Instead, they describe a city where there was a very strong sense of community, where the cost of... Uh, living was extremely cheap, where yes, there, could, there was certainly an edgy side to the experience of living, but that the experience of living there was so powerful and exciting that rather than not wanting to live in the city, the great fear of any of these people was to actually leave the city, even for kind of an important uh, family occasion, or in Anne Magnuson's case, going to get her kind of, you know, going to her graduation ceremony. She didn't want to leave, you know, such was the, the compelling nature of New York City during this period. She didn't even want to leave it for a single night or a single weekend to go and graduate. So it's the opposite. New York City wasn't this kind of plate, this kind of horror, horror kind of um, terrain, hor awful terrain that was kind of unlivable, but was instead this kind of, you know, extraordinarily dynamic uh, and often very communally based experience which produces the culture that I've uh, have gone on to, to write about um, in these books. So what happens in the early 1980s, and I'll go on to describe why it becomes a distinctive period in, in just a moment, um, is we have this kind of this peak, if you like, of, of a series of developments that have been um, uh, de unfolding during the 1970s. And yet it's a period that, again, I hadn't planned to write about, and I also kind of, it was pretty easy to kind of uh, understand early on that no one else has really written about it. And then the questions start to emerge about, well, why has this period not been kind of examined? And arguably the, the period has kind of fallen uh, outside of the radar of cultural historians, in part because what was going on was um, of a specific kind of character. Um, that much of the culture that kind of came through in this period was what we might call mutant culture or hybrid culture. It was culture that bore the hallmarks of what we could call convergence, which is a word I'll probably come back to again and again and again. Uh, it seems to kind of define much of what was going on uh, in New York City here. So we've got to the point in history where we tend to understand an awful lot of, in particular, music books um, get written about kind of genres. Yeah, we have books about punk in particular, or rock, or disco, which is kind of, was they were slower to merge the books about disco, maybe because of, min of the minoritarian underpinnings of disco, but now we have books about disco, and, and so on and so forth, that we get books that are organized, and, w and which are marketed and reach audiences around which the wider music industry, if you like, gets to be organized. Everything has a name and exists under a category which you can immediately relate to and identify with. And what goes on in the early 1980s doesn't work in that way at all. Um, everything seems to be borrowing from everything else simultaneously. The, nothing is clearly defined. Everything seems to be mobile, seems to be flexible, seems to be forever, un, uh, forever mutating. Um, and so we get, it, it's also come to pass as a result of this the, the general understanding of, of contemporary electronic dance music culture in particular, and in particular the rise of house and then um, subsequently techno, um, is that house music, in the words of Frankie Knuckles, uh, the, well, the, one of these legendary DJs who was kind of played a major role in the development of house music in Chicago uh, in the, during the 1980s, has described house music as being disco's revenge. Um, that house music emerged um, as a response to the backlash against disco, 
So I'll talk about this in just a moment, but the backlash against disco kind of reaches its peak in the summer of 1979. House music emerges in 1984. And so there's this general, um, there has been, uh, maybe until re relatively recently, a general um, analysis that sees the early 1980s, this post-disco moment, as a fallow period in the history of dance music. It was a period when the nation, uh, the United States, turned against disco um, in, in ways that were you know, overtly homophobic and I'd also argue pretty overtly racist and sexist. Um, and that after that period, dance music lay fallow until house music as disco's revenge came along uh, in 1985 and kind of gave rebirth to dance music. And so the argument of this book is that that's complete, a completely false analysis, even though it's the most salient and popular analysis of, of, of how house music came about. That instead, you know, what I argue is that this period of the early 1980s was, if anything, in, part, in terms of party culture and party music, more prolific than the period that preceded it, more prolific um, than the 1970s, but partly because of its kind of mutant characteristics. Um, it's something that generally hasn't been uh, given too much analysis. So what happens in the early 1980s is we see... Um, the convergence or the aligning, alignment or the coming together of three scenes that had kind of taken root in different kind of discrete ways during the 1970s. Um, and these scenes are the post-disco dance scene, uh, what I like to call the art punk scene, which kind of obviously grew out of the punk scene. And the thing that kind of emerged sort of during the 70s, but really came to be more identifiable uh, only at the very end of the 1970s, was this thing that we call we can call rap music now. And I would almost hesitatingly say we could call it hip hop, except I don't think that hip hop really existed during the 1970s. So I'll come onto that a little bit later and um, see how that argument goes down. But uh, yes. So the three scenes that are developed in the 1970s come together in this early 1980 period. And what I want to kind of try and do is like just give an overview of, of how they got to this point in the early 1980s before then exploring the way that they kind of interact with one another. So, uh, beginning with disco, um, one popular understanding of disco is that it kind of it was a kind of the one of the the main genre that came to a you know define 1970s uh, U.S. music culture, and in many ways defined it as kind of a being a, a, an error, a mistake uh, about bad taste over commercialization. Um, which I don't think is kind of accurate, although there was a manifestation of that which kind of sort of, you know, has some veracity. So in, DJ culture really began, and what we call disco really began, in this pre-disco moment. I don't, I don't believe, but I might be wrong, that that many people are aware that disco didn't even come into existence as a name and as a recognizable genre until 1974. So effectively, we've already got the first four years of the 1970s when DJ culture is spreading prolifically. This culture in which DJs select music in relationship to the energy of their dance crowds, uh, which are in, in many cases definitely, definitionally um, diverse and minoritarian. And this is unfolding for four years before, in 1974, it starts to become a, a recognizable genre, which gets to be named in Billboard, starts to get to the top of the charts, and so on and so forth. The music develops probably for about, well, let's say three or four years until at the end of 1977, Saturday Night Fever is released. I think it's prob Saturday Night Fever is, I could talk for hours about this, but I'll try not to. But just to say briefly, it was probably made as a pretty innocent movie about um, a culture that did exist. Whether it was an accurate representation of the culture or not is, you know, we can take, we can talk about afterwards or another time. In some ways, it was was it was quite accurate. In other ways, it was somewhat fictional. But it was it was about uh, no one expected Saturday Night Fever to become the kind of phenomenon that it did. It became the second best box selling um, film of all time and the be best selling out the the soundtrack was the best-selling album of all time and it was during the rise of Saturday Night Fever that the major record companies which had had only disdain for disco up until that point started to think that if they entered the disco market open disco departments then they could make some money about it and so the major labels with Warners effectively taking the lead started to heavily produce disco arguably overproduce disco uh, from around about uh, well it was you know towards the end of 1978 onwards but also the independent record companies started to think that if you 
put a four on the floor bass beat under any record, whether it was even a, you know, a rock record, a folk record, it really didn't matter what, you could potentially make the kind of money that the Bee Gees were making. The Bee Gees themselves had come from, I believe, a kind of, a kind of folky background, a folk rock background, for example. So they seemed to be an example of the way that anyone could enter this market um, and could make money on it. And to Disco's undying credit, it was also a very open and exclusive kind of um, musical phenomenon and cultural phenomenon. It did say that if you kind of have this matrix of a certain uh, beat structure, um, that you could indeed almost layer anything on top of that, and in which case it became a very open and mutable form. The downside was that the overproduction of this music uh, for you know, fairly cynical and commercial reasons coincided with the second downturn in the US economy of the 1970s. And um, it, it was in this moment that, um, in particular, I would say, kind of uh, C2 workers um, who had felt as though they were being left behind uh, within the American dream. Um, as, um, as and the, the decline of industry, which had sort of started to take root in the late 1960s, had disproportionately affected their livelihoods, and they didn't have, and, uh, uh, and that they felt they didn't have a government that supported their interests. Some of what I'm saying, you know, arguably resonates very heavily with the last election. I would sort of say that, you know, in a way, we can trace back, you know, the the election of Trump to this the precise same moment that saw Reagan elected by not only a, uh, the Christian, uh, the moral majority, but also a group of workers who had historically voted Democrat, but felt that the Democratic Party was no longer representing their interests and, and suddenly flipped to the Republican Party. And it was in this fairly explosive scenario that people started to look for a scapegoat, for, for someone to blame for the failures of, of the you know, United States economy and its wider sense of its place in the world. This, for example, as you might, some of you might remember, some of you might know anyway, was also the period of the Iran hostage crisis. So all of a sudden, this idea of America being a kind of global power with authority to kind of do as it likes in the world, this was still very much the height of the Cold War, um, suddenly started to get undermined. And so look Looking for a scapegoat, there was this big um, backlash against disco, uh, which we see here. This is uh, Comiskey Park in Chicago in, the, in July 1979. Um, a rock music talk host DJ called Steve Dull decided to hold it, who was the kind of one of the symbolic leaders of the anti-disco or disco sucks movement, decided to hold um, an anti-disco rally during a baseball double header at Comiskey Park. Uh, if you, if, if you, if um, a spectator bought along a disco record and donated that disco record, um, they could get in for free. 40,000 people got into the ground with these disco records, and other 40,000 people were locked outside. There was kind of, you know, something was going on here. Um, and at halftime, Steve Dahl notoriously uh, had these, vine these disco records piled up into a vinyl mountain and explode, detonated them. Um, you know, you know the, it sounds melodramatic to draw parallels with Nazi Germany. It is melodramatic <laughs> to draw parallels with Nazi Germany. And yet this was this kind of um, burning of culture was something that didn't have an obvious parallel uh, other than the uh, previously had gone on in, in Nazi Germany, where jazz music had also been destroyed. So it's in this moment there's the backlash against disco, and very shortly afterwards uh, we see, for example, of you know something like 15,000 discotheques uh, close across the United States. Um, the major label records pull out of disco. They close their disco departments, even though arguably this was the, the downturn in the economy and the downturn in the music industry was something that was happening across the board. It wasn't just happening in, in disco at all. And so this is the period when, indeed, disc there's this, this slogan, death to disco, uh, starts to circulate. And it's, the general assumption is that this is when dance music or DJ culture that had flourished during the 1970s effectively dies. One of the twists of this story that rarely gets to be dis discussed or mentioned, uh, but which I certainly made something of in Love Saves a Day because it's what the inter people I interviewed were telling me, is that it wasn't just... Um, bunch of people who are into rock music or people who are homophobic or racist or whatever it might be who would turn against disco. Uh, 
Um, the, in fact, the, the pioneering DJs who had brought this sound into fruition in the first place, into being in the first place, also grew sick of disco because it had become a music that they didn't, they didn't think the music had. The music that was big, ring, being recorded lacked value and it wasn't, making, it wasn't working on their dance floors. And DJs ultimately are kind of very pragmatic workers. They have to kind of be feeding their audiences with fresh music, uh, that they're all fresh sounds, and these, sound, these sounds can be old, but as long as it's fresh, it makes the audiences want to dance. Um, so it wasn't just kind of, it was, you know, there was a general feeling that this, um, something other than disco needed to be introduced at this particular moment. So it's in this situation at the very beginning of, of 1980, just at the moment when, we're, uh, when the media headlines had it that disco had died, that in fact we see, although there's this kind of decline in, in, in dance music or disco culture nationwide, in New York City, um, the culture has become this way of life. It's the city where the culture was effectively born. Uh, it has the DJs who had the greatest sense of integrity and, and creativity, partly because they are products of this, of this city, which has been a historic melting pot city of different people coming together and forming these uh, communities that then took root in a particularly powerful way on the New York City dance floor in the early 1970s. And at the very moment when it's assumed that the kind of the national culture has died, becomes instead the moment when it begins to e accelerate even more powerfully uh, in New York City. And it does so without, with being off, while, while being off of the radar. So the Paradise Garage, for example, which is um, now often seen as being the most influential party space in the history of New York City, um, where Michael Brody was the owner, um, effectively, the parties begin in January 1977 as construction parties. The venue officially opens properly around September 1978. But for at least the first year and three months, although Friday nights are going quite strong, it can't find any way whatsoever to fill Saturday nights. There's even a point, a very contentious point, uh, during what seems to have been the second half of 1979, when the owner of what, what is often now seen as this definitively uh, integrated and multicultural and polysexual venue uh, turned what Saturday nights into a white male gay only night much to the kind of um, displeasure of of many of the kind of dancers who had gone in uh, gone had contributed to creating the event sorry I should have put this slide I'm not very good at slides sometimes um, this is Larry Levan the DJ at the Paradise Garage on the left here so even in, even in late 1979, there was this kind of overwhelming sense that um, there was this sense that new, the Paradise Garage wasn't quite, hadn't quite found um, its full form, its most, its most successful um, means of uh, form of expression. Um, and it's only in, in the beginning of, very, of 1980, um, at the point when this experiment to turn Saturday nights into a um, white white gay night, which in many ways went against the ethos of the integrated downtown disco, that the garage really starts to kind of fire. Um, it happens because Larry Levan goes away because the experiment has failed. Larry Levan, who has not actually succeeded in turning Saturday nights into a successful night for, you know, maybe reasons of competition. Uh, there's no real kind of clear-cut answer to why it wasn't succeeding on the Saturday night. Um, goes away for the weekend. A, a friend of Larry Levan's from a rival but much smaller club, T. Scott, comes to play at the venue. And this suddenly seems to kind of create a new sense of interest and energy about what's going on on Saturday night. Uh, people turn out to see how this other DJ, T. Scott, performs. And he, he, he plays the system so hard, he ends up kind of breaking a whole bunch of speakers. And the next week, people want to kind of see if Larry Levan can kind of match uh, what T. Scott had done. And it's around this point that Saturday nights, uh, at the very beginning of 1980, take off. My Michael Brody also starts around this period to book acts, uh, acts that are breaking through on the dance scene to perform at the Paradise Garage on not only Fridays but also Saturday nights. And so in, in different ways that in and of themselves are not necessarily historically that significant, um, the Paradise Garage begins to really roll in the beginning of 1970, 1980, at the very moment when the rest of the nation thinks that kind of dance music culture has died. 
We can say across the board that the same goes on across other post-disco dance venues in New York City. So the loft, David Mancuso's loft, which had kind of started the culture rolling in many ways, along with the sanctuary, which also um, opened, uh, well, um, took off in early 1970. The loft, which had been running since 1970, also reaches its own peak in the early 1980s. It's in this period that David Mancuso, for example, perfects his sound system. He starts to get into very high-end audiophile technolo technology that he's uh, buying from Lyric Hi-Fi. The Coetzo cartridges that he uh, buys from Japan alone would today cost something like $8,000 or $10,000 or something. So he gets into uh, very high-fi audio, and it's during, the, uh, during this very uh, period in the very early 1980s that Mancuso perfects his sound system. Also within the post-disco dance scene, we have you know, this, this kind of crowd that is operates in a way that's relatively unto itself, the white gay dance crowd, who had been dancing primarily uh, to other private party venues in New York City during the 70s. One is called Flamingo, another one is called 12 West. Um, they've been, along with the loft and the garage, very influential in kind of in, in pushing disco in the first place and a, a broad range of dance sounds. It's in the autumn of 1980 that uh, a New York City entrepreneur um, called Bruce Mailman, who's also opened a kind of gay bathhouse called the St. Mark's Bars, decides to open the Saint. So we see one of the flyers for the Saint here. Uh, this is this is also include this flyer includes the photos of Rob, uh, a couple of the photos of Robert Maplethorpe, um, the the famed New York City uh, photographer. And the Saint opens in 1980 uh, with the innovation, which, uh, which at the time was seen as extraordinary, of, of uh, first of all, well, being located in in an old rock venue called the Fillmore East, which which uh, was a, thea a theater and a concert venue that was was somewhat transformed. And the major part of this transformation was to create a planetarium a planetarium uh, dome on the roof. So that the venue would become this kind of immersive space of partying, where you would go and uh, you would enter the venue at midnight, and the party. This is actually true of almost all of the parties that I've spoken about so far. The party would begin at midnight and would often carry on until 10, 11, 12 the next morning. And so it's again at this point, um, in 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 this case, in the autumn of 1980, the point where this, where dance culture is supposed to have died, that it reaches a new level of, of immersive uh, experience when the saint opens in the autumn. And in, this, in the saint, you'll have uh, something like maybe 4,000 dancers going every night. So in short, in, in 1980, instead of this culture being dead, what we see is this kind of the culture reaching a new peak, but largely happening outside of the public eye, in part because a lot of these venues are also uh, structured as private parties. Uh, pri yeah, private parties. You have to be a member or recommended by someone, a guest of someone, in order to get in. This is not for reasons of exclusivity, which is sometimes supposed. It's for reasons of bypassing New York's notorious cabaret licensing laws. Um, so as long as you didn't sell uh, alcohol, you could open a party and therefore avoid the licensing laws that would require you to close at 3 p.m. So we have this explosion of the post-disco dance scene. The second scene, I'm always struggling for time with these things, uh, is the art punk scene, um, which had also taken root uh, in New York City during the 1970s. Notoriously, it was around 1974 the um, television and other bands, including the Ramones, soon afterwards Blondie and Talking Heads, started a, started a perform at uh, CBGB's. Punk music in many ways peaked around about 1976 to 1977. The same culture was also uh, unfolding in, in the United Kingdom, uh, where Malcolm McLaren had, had managed the New York Dolls, had seen the Ramones and decided to kind of model the Sex Pistols partly on his experiences of being based in New York City. Um, at one point during 76 and 77, Sire Records, but a bunch of other labels were beginning to think that it might be punk, and they were hoping that it might be punk that would become the kind of big commercial savior of the music industry uh, instead of disco. In fact, through Saturday Night Fever, it was disco that won that particular battle. Sorry, this is, uh, this is the scene at CBGB's, uh, the notorious uh, graffiti uh, toilets at CBGB's. So it was, um, so punk didn't um, end up 
uh, outperforming uh, or outselling disco uh, during the middle to latter part of the 1970s. And at the same time, it was a whole bunch, a group of punks who were heading on a, on a regular basis to CBGBs that started to uh, ex uh, become dis dis dissatisfied with some of the limitations of punk. And in particular, punk's uh, shaping uh, its, of itself as effectively a, a white ethnic culture, as a form of rock music that wanted to self-consciously break with early rock music's uh, fascination with um, and attraction to black R&B music, which had informed, and rock and roll music, which had informed many of the earliest recordings of bands like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. So punk had kind of reacted against this, but to the point where the music was undanceable, and if you went to a venue such as CBGB or Max's Kansas City, there, weren't, there was no dancing and there, was, there were no dance floors. It was... Um, this guy on the left, Steve Mass, uh, who went on to, uh, who was an entrepreneur and was running an ambulance service, and the guy on the right, Diego Cortez, who was a kind of art entrepreneur um, and another CBGB regular, and along with a, a friend of theirs, Anya Phillips, who was a kind of SM punk designer and would soon go on to manage uh, the No Wave band, um, The Contortions, which was led by Anya Phillips's boyfriend, James Chance. Steve Mass, Diego Cortez, and Anya Phillips were, came up with the idea of opening what, what they framed as a punk discotheque. The idea that you could be into punk music, uh, but you wanted to be able to dance, but you didn't want to dance to what Diego Cortez described as the kind of the auto beats of the NYC disco. Generally speaking, punk saw disco as being plastic, predictable, um, superficial, and apolitical. They had no idea whatsoever about what was going on downtown in venues like the Loft and the Paradise Garage and a whole slew of other venues that were producing what I see as this quite radical um, sonic and social culture. Instead, they were just looking at midtown discotheques such as Studio 54 and New York, New York and Xenon. Didn't like what they saw in terms of its kind of music and its style, but nevertheless wanted to start dancing. And so... Whoops. So they opened the Mud Club. Uh, in fact, Steve Mass opened the Mud Club in, in Hall on Halloween 1978. And um, it, it's, it's built as a, as a, indeed, as a punk discotheque, where there's a, the, for, the, in the, for the first time you can go to a punk venue, and as well as having live bands playing, because often there were live bands every night, and as well as being able to see experimental video and cinema, because this was, one of the, this was probably the first club, the first, if not one of the first clubs where you're able to do that. Um, in addition to these, these and other various cultural happenings, you could also dance to DJ selections every night. So this begins in late 1978, and it becomes one of the most prolific kind of producers of culture in New York City during the late 70s, and in particular during the early 1980s. One of the things that happens towards the very end of 1979, this moment that just follows the kind of peak of the backlash against, culture, uh, against disco, is that a, a guy called Johnny Dinell, um, who's in a no-wave band and an aspiring artist, uh, goes up to Steve Mass and asks Steve Mass if he can get a job in the mud club. And Steve Mass says, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to work in the bar? Do you, you, know, you tell me. And Johnny Dinell says, well, I'd like to be, I'd like to be a DJ. Um, the, the DJs didn't have the same status in the mud club as they might have had in a place like the garage or the loft. But anyway, this is what Johnny Dunnell wanted to do. <clears throat> and in the spirit of the times, he decides that he's going to do DJing as a form of performance art. So he thinks, what's the kind of ultimate um, punk gesture that a DJ can make in the mud club? The ultimate punk gesture uh, for a DJ in the mud club is to play disco music. So he dresses up. I mean, he's a, he's a beautiful, he's a, I should have, included a photo of Johnny here, really, but he's a very, very good-looking guy, uh, very extremely beautiful. And he dressed up as if he was John Travolta. He kind of wore the tight, the tight Jordashi jeans and kind of the, there was a, a, and a whole lot of glitter and he got a lot of commercial disco records. And he's, so he goes into the Mud Club, again, it's ver the very end of 1979, maybe even the beginning of 80, there's no date for this kind of particular performance, and starts to play this disco music to... His amazement, the reaction he gets is that all of these punks, instead of uh, throwing beer bottles at him or kind of telling, you know, uh, abusing him, start to dance. 
And so we have this beginnings in this kind of early moments of this kind of point where these, these um, entrenched oppositional cultures of the 1970s that supposedly, I mean, somewhat mythologically, have these completely contrasting values start to come together in this kind of uh, uh, late 1970s, very early 1980s period, partly because punks are wanting to engage with, with some kind of dance culture. Around soon after the opening of the Mud Club, we have this kind of a, a whole series of other, you know, art punk uh, venues start to open. So Club 57 um, opens around, effectively opens or gets going around the spring of 1979. This is Anne Magnuson, the woman who uh, described living in New York City as being like Halloween every night uh, that I mentioned a little earlier. Um, Club 57 has, is, is based on St. Mark's Place uh, on 8th Street. And... Um, <clears throat> They have it's a it's a it's there's more of a local community living in that area, so they have certain noise problems. So it's in Club 57 to avoid some of the noise complaints. They start to do a lot more. They they have this extraordinarily varied program that's going on six nights a week. But a lot of this this uh, a lot of the activities that unfolds at Club 57 is more performance based. It's uh, a lot of performance art. It also happens to be the venue where someone like Keith Herring and a whole bunch of other students from SVA start to go on a on a nightly basis. Uh, what we see here is just one example of the kind of performances that would go on at Club 57. This is a ladies wrestling night. Uh, and Anne Magnuson is, is flat out on her back as a, as a result of I'm not quite sure what. Another key venue that opens within this whole art punk ter um, terrain uh, is called Danceteria. Opens early in 1980. This is the first, this opened by two um, interesting guys, uh, one called Jim Forat, who was one of the founding figures of the Gay Liberation Front, another called Rudolf Piper, who's a kind of uh, German-born hedonist who had kind of moved to the city from Brazil with a fair amount of money uh, to invest in opening places like Danceteria. And Danceteria's kind of unique um, uh, aspect, if you like, is it's the, the first venue to open over three floors. It has one floor for DJing, another floor for live bands, and another floor is as an experimental video lounge. It's already unusual to have live bands and DJs in the same venue. This is a new thing. But what Jim Forat, one of the, the you know the key curator figure at Danceteria, does is he decides that on the dance floor, already itself unusual in a kind of punk-oriented club, he's going to get two DJs to play next to each other. And he invites one DJ who's a punk DJ, Sean Cassette, and another DJ who's effectively a disco DJ, Mark Caymans. And he says, here's the turntable. You sort it out between yourselves. Um, and again, all of a sudden, we have you know these two kind of DJs from dis largely discrete backgrounds are asked to share a turntable. And initially, they're not sure it's going to work. Initially, they think it'll be rivalrous. Initially, initially, they think it could be tense. And instead, what Mark Kamen's, uh, he very kind of tragically died a few years ago from a heart attack. Um, but what he told me in one of the uh, the interviews that we conducted with uh, together told me is that. The music was different, but effectively the heartbeat was the same. And all of a sudden they found they had this communication. So the divisions and the barriers, some of them, although not exclusively, but some of them created by the marketing departments or music industries who wanted to find a way to kind of reach audiences in distinctive ways and set up comp false competition between them. Away from those divisions, they suddenly these, the punk DJ and the dance music DJ find that they're moving in a, they're, they're listening to music in a similar way, and very soon afterwards, music starts to come through that bears the hallmarks of being both punk oriented and and dance music oriented, because indeed this is where the city wants to be moving at this particular point. Another venue opens um, at the end of 1981 called Pyramid. This is, I mean, just to briefly mention, it inherits some of the performance qualities of Club 57. Uh, it aspires to be like Club 57 in, in many ways, but this is really the first New York City party space where drag queens uh, start to kind of become a dominant presence on the dance floor. And it's a, another aspect of in this in what's supposed to be a fallow dead period of New York City culture. In fact, it kind of starts to reach a kind of a new crescendo. Uh, here we have um, Keith Herring on the left at a poetry performance reading night at Club 57. Um, and Keith Herring was typical of the way that artists in this in this period, many of them drawn to punk culture and you know punk's anti-establishment. Um, ethos 
um, start to go into party spaces like Club 57, and they soon, very soon afterwards, start to put on exhibitions in these spaces. As far as they're concerned, the New York City gallery system, and, the, uh, and in particular, even the downtown uh, gallery system, is entirely closed to them. But it's in these club spaces where anything can happen, and where people find themselves congregating every night, and effectively participating in the way that these spaces get to be curated, um, and, and therefore getting their breaks in, in, these, in, these, demo, in these democratic spaces. Jean-Michel Basquiat here on the left, another kind of key figure from the period who had uh, started to make a bit of a name for himself as the graffiti artist who went under the name with Al Diaz called Samo. <clears throat> uh, Basquiat effectively gets his, his own breaks through the mud club. He meets the guy who would go on to encourage him to sort of develop his graffiti into sort of more developed paintings. He meets this guy, Diego Cortez, who we saw a little earlier, on the dance floor of the Mud Club. This is where democratic social interactions were happening and where people started to get ideas about how to collaborate and take things, take things forward. So Basquiat gets kind of, you know, his major art break through participating in the Mud Club. <clears throat> um, here we see him playing uh, clarinet and in, in the band he forms called Grey. Basquiat had no formal uh, mu mu uh, musical training whatsoever, but he formed Gray uh, with, with the idea that its, mu its participants, its musicians, <clears throat> should assume the mindset of an alien who comes to Earth, finds an instrument, doesn't know how to play the instrument, but picks it up wanting to make the most beautiful and unusual sounds with it. Um, and so this is Gray performing at Harar, another kind of arts uh, art punk discotheque uh, from the period. <clears throat> and this gesture of um, musicians, um, sorry, artists picking up uh, joining bands became one of the great phenomena of the era. There was one point where it was kind of, it seemed to be almost mandatory that you would be in a band even if you didn't have any musical skills. I mean, in many ways, this goes back to punk music and the idea that music should be democratic, that it shouldn't be about skilled playing, that it was about what you felt and what you expressed more than your technical ability to do anything. But it, this, this kind of initial gesture kind of reached its peak in this, in this late 70s and in particular early 1980s period with Basquiat, one of you know, many people who were joining bands at this point. It's it's very soon after this that Basquiat also <clears throat> uh, takes on, the, gets to play the lead actor in, in, a, in a film called Downtown 81. Um, so we have Basquiat is making fine art, he's leading a band, he's the lead actor in a film. And this was, although Basquiat was unusually charismatic and unusually talented, we might kind of say, this was what was being enabled within the scene, within these network of relationships that were happening in party spaces in this time. And so artists were getting their breaks in club and they were also expressing, you know, arguably an unprecedented form of mobility of expression uh, within these spaces as well. So, oh, and sorry, this, so, so we have this kind of, we have this creative explosion. Um, this is just an example of a club night, for example, at the Mud Club. This is the rock and roll funeral ball extravaganza, uh, which was, a t uh, again, it was a fairly typical immersive happening that would be staged regularly at the Mud Club, but also in all of the, many of these other party spaces. Um, in which, in this particular instance, a whole night was dedicated to recreating um, the way that major rock and roll stars had committed suicide um, and you know, reincarnate, reincarnating the, their staging of their desks with hearses and funeral caskets brought in. The DJ, Anita Sarko was DJing that night, for example, so she was also supposed, supposed to play on this theme of dead rock stars, the rock and roll funeral extravaganza ball. One thing she told uh, Anita, committed suicide. I think it's pretty almost two years ago, so there's been a fair amount of loss since, um, since some of these interviews were conducted. Anita said that she played Paul McCartney songs at the Dead Rock Stars. Uh, um, sorry, I should say Wing, Wings, which was Paul McCartney's post-Beatles post uh, band. She played a lot of Wings that night because the only explanation for just how bad Wings turned out to be was that actually it wasn't Paul McCartney who was kind of leading the band at all and that actually he was dead. So this were, these, were the, <laughs> these, were the way, these were some of the ways in which, you know, DJs were operating within, within this particular kind of, with, 
within this particular setting. The third scene, um, and I'm struggling for time here. I'll try and I'll try and move it along. The third scene that kind of develops, and this is this is uh, it's not an afterthought in any way whatsoever, but it doesn't develop in quite the same way and within quite the same pace as the other two scenes. Is the scene that we would now call the hip hop scene, but it's a scene that didn't straightforwardly <clears throat> um, exist as hip hop during the 1970s. So. The way that I see it very clearly, and I'll, I'll try not to get into too much detail here because we just don't have time for it, is that there was party culture in the South Bronx during the 1970s. And in some respects, there were some things that were somewhat distinctive about that party culture in the South Bronx in the 1970s. But overwhelmingly, that culture was connected to the rest of DJ culture in Manhattan. The DJs were selecting the same music, the dancers were largely dancing in the same kind of ways, and the culture didn't see itself as being particularly distinctive. It didn't have a name for itself as, as even being particularly distinctive. Here we see Africa Bambata with a stick, uh, center stage. Um, he was one of three key DJs to kind of, who to began to kind of rule the South Bronx party scene during this period. Uh, DJ Cool Herc was the first, Bambata was the second, and Grandmaster Flash came through as the third. Um, the thing that did mark this um, scene out primarily from the other scene um, wasn't graffiti, because that was in, almost entirely separate from the party scene, I would argue, um, but was the fact that um, rapping was introduced over the DJ, DJ selections at this, uh, in this particular setting. Um, but the rapping was often happening not just over funk music, which is how most uh, hip hop historians would probably figure it, but was happening as much over disco as, as every other uh, sound out there. We are now in the point where the way that rap music and hip hop history overwhelmingly gets to be configured is that rap and hip hop were a direct reaction against uh, disco music. Uh, that disco represented a whitening of um, black music culture, and that rap music had effectively started to aim to blacken the music again. But as I said a little earlier, and I, you know, I think this is, you know, I, I just think the evidence is there to support this in a quite powerful ways. This wasn't just about kind of um, <clears throat> black. DJs responding against the whitening of disco, because what we also saw within what we generally call the disco scene is we saw those DJs also reacting against the commercialization of disco culture. In other words, when hip hop DJ, what we now call hip hop DJs, often reacted against disco and started to think that it was diluting black music, we in the thing that hasn't been reported is that you know these legendary DJs who also started a um, who, who contributed to the development of disco and the spread of disco were also turning against disco in this point. So it wasn't a point of separation at all. It was actually, if anything, a point of, of, of uh, unity and agreement. Rap music starts to be kind of recorded, as is, is very well known, uh, around, I think it's the August 1979, when Rapper's Delight gets to be released. Um, and Rapper's Delight, as is well established, is basically a, a rap over a, um, the recreation of Chic uh, playing Good Times, which was one of the biggest kind of disco records of 1979. So rap music from the very beginning was always kind of grounded on disco grooves and disco breaks. You won't, uh, for, for various reasons, read about this in hip hop histories, but in interviews with Bambata and a whole bunch of other people who are part of this scene, they confirmed that indeed hip hop DJs were kind of killing disc disco breaks because you know disco above all else was the kind of the sound that it was in which it was ver effectively mandatory for there to be a break but the thing we see about rap culture is that not that it's a kind of segmented enclosed entirely discrete inward looking culture the very whole the whole foundation of rap culture is to kind of engage with found objects and to manipulate found objects you know Bambata is known as the master of records, for example. That becomes his nickname. He's draw and he's called that because he has his record collection is insanely diverse. He's playing kids' theme tunes. He's playing Brazilian music. You know, you name it. If it has that kind of feel, Bambata will play it. So hip, you know, the Bronx party scene, even though it's somewhat unto itself, is also ready to be open to engage with whatever um, music or whatever relationships can help it take its aesthetic forward. And so this also sets up rap music as being kind of, you know, um, unique, well, not uniquely placed, but 
positively placed, productively placed, to start to uh, join in this kind of interaction with these three scenes. <clears throat> So what we see in this early 1980s period is this coming together of these three scenes. And I think that hip, what becomes known as hip-hop is a kind of quite an interesting example of, of what happens when these three scenes come together. Hip-hop uh, only enters into the lexicon um, <clears throat> during 1981 and, and in print in 1982. So one could, for example, begin to make the argument, I do, that if the name doesn't exist, then is there any evidence that kind of even the participants in this culture are thinking about hip hop in this way? I should probably quickly say that when I, when I talk about hip hop, and this is fairly, fairly well established, but just to clarify anyway, it's the kind of the idea that the, these four elements are forming part of a synergistic kind of culture, a, a unified culture, the four elements being DJing, MCing, breaking, <clears throat> and graffiti. Again, there's, there's, there's very little evidence that these, that hip hop was in, well, there's no evidence, I don't think, that hip hop was in circulation as a term during the 1970s. Um, and there's also very little evidence that hip hop existed as a cultural phenomenon during the 1970s. One quick, exa one quick example of this, if graffiti was supposed to be integral to hip hop, there was graffiti, in fact, during the 1970s, was completely distinct from uh, Bronx party culture. If you went to a party, you wouldn't see graffiti artists kind of participating in that party, maybe doing graffiti art as the DJ is going about his or her work, although I'm not too sure there were female DJs uh, operating in, in the Bronx in this particular moment. So the argument is partly that the DJing and MCing were discreet from graffiti during the 1970s, really totally discreet. Even breaking was much less prominent within within. Bronx party culture th than is often assumed. Hip hop starts to come about um, when Fab Five Freddy, Fred Brathwaite, um, here pictured at the end of a film, film a filming session of a of a kind of art punk TV program called TV Party, starts to head regularly um, to the Mud Club, <clears throat> then participates in a explosive, um, broad ranging. Uh, art show that takes place in Times Square in the summer of 1980. And it's there that he meets Charlie Ahern, who is a, a experimental art punk director who has also largely been hanging out at the, at the Mud Club. And they decide to make a film about graffiti. Um, it's soon after that, partly because Fab Five Freddy has also been going to CBGB's as well as the Mud Club. He's been reading the same kind of books and the same kind of theory that a lot of the kind of art punk crowd are reading, that he decides that the, the film about graffiti will have more impact um, if they effectively form, uh, reform it, or, or I should say, figure it as part of a wider subculture that has not only art as one of its elements, but also has music and also a dance style. And it's at this point that Fab by Freddy decides that while this film that they're gonna make about graffiti culture, a film that goes on to be called Wild Style, should instead um, be about this, this broader culture. And so here what we can sort of say is that it's the beginning of hip hop um, coming into being, and it's partly inspired by the idea of convergence, this idea which is taking root within the downtown scene where all these discrete elements are beginning to be pieced together. And the same happens with, with hip hop. Hip hop is about largely discrete elements, emceeing and DJing on the one hand, to a certain extent breaking on another, and thirdly graffiti, these discrete elements being formed as a kind of, as a coherent culture. Um, and so it's within downtown and within this idea of convergence and these different cultures coming together that Fab Five Freddy has the idea that goes on to become uh, hip hop. Um, this is, this hip hop then is kind of brought into uh, being in, a, in, a, in an accelerated way when, um, Another um, African-American who's participating in the whole downtown art punk scene called Michael Holman reads an article about Fab Five Freddy that's been in the Village Voice. This is pre-Fab Five Freddy uh, 
deciding to make this, fil this film wild style with Charlie Ahern, invites him into one of these party settings. Um, Malcolm McLaren, uh, the, the British entrepreneur and impresario who has kind of, you know, done much to motor punk ahead in the United Kingdom and is getting a lot of his inspiration from New York City, is also at this party. And Michael Holman takes Malcolm McLaren to go and see African Barbata DJing. Um, and at the end of that uh, experience, McLaren turns around to Michael Holman and says, why don't you kind of create uh, an opening act for my new band, which is going to perform at this another kind of live venue called the Ritz um, within a couple of months. And it's at this point that Michael Holman decides to kind of invite Africa Bambata, um, <clears throat> uh, MC, uh, M Bronx MCs, uh, Breakers, and also a graffiti artist to, be, to create this opening show for this band of, of Malcolm McLaren's called Bow Wow Wow, this kind of post-punk band that comes through uh, in the UK. This is the first time that hip-hop effectively uh, comes into being. It's in the spring of 1981. And again, it's Michael Holman through this kind of, through this quite intellectual, culturally very, very dynamic scene, deciding to bring all of these elements together and putting them together for the first time. So it's, in, it's around this point that um, hip-hop comes into being. Ruza Blue, uh, who is a punk who's working for Malcolm McLaren, who started to run a, a regular night at a Second Avenue dub reggae venue called Negril, uh, is blown away by, in particular, the breaking and the graffiti and the, the DJing that she sees at this show. She invites Michael Holman to start staging uh, his, this talent at this club called Negril. Um, and so here we see uh, Jazzy J, one of the uh, Zulu Nation DJs, uh, who works alongside Africa Bambata, performing at Negril. And this is a downtown club. So where hip-hop effectively starts to happen, if anything in this period, is in downtown. And when Fred Brathwaite and Charlie Hearn go uptown to do their research, they're not seeing hip-hop in action. As far as they're concerned, you know, this, this, these four elements are not even necessarily cohering in the Bronx in the way that they are in downtown. So it's in, it's in this petri dish of experimentation and bringing different elements together that we see culture exploding, uh, but in, 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 in this period. <clears throat> One of the things that rarely gets to be remarked upon, because in general, the way that history gets to be written about is to see scenes as being distinctive, as being separate, as being oppositional, and having their identity by being distinct from other scenes. But it's during this period that we see Bronx DJs and art punk DJs, who are already supposed to be um, <clears throat> At, uh, at loggerheads with each other because they come from completely different backgrounds, instead heading regularly to the Paradise Garage, uh, this kind of post-disco dance venue where Larry Levan is not just playing disco music or post-disco music, but is playing this broad range of sounds. Uh, so we start to also see these interactions between these DJs. Bambata is going to the Paradise Garage. Uh, Fab Five Freddy is going to the, the Paradise Garage. But then a whole bunch of art punk DJs, including people like Mark Kamens, who... Uh, one of these dance interior DJs is also going to the Paradise Garage. It's as if this is it, it's, it's as if the culture and the potentiality of culture and the social interactions that can come out of culture begin to kind of completely become completely fluid um, and collaborative in this particular period. And yet, it's something that has not, for, for reasons that I touched on earlier, been written about at all, and that when the culture does get to be written about, it's separated out. We don't read about the Bronx, uh, what we can now maybe call hip-hop DJs, going to the Paradise Garage, because instead rap is figured as being historically oppositional to disco and then house music. One thing I'll just throw in in passing um, is the way that these different communities uh, were coming together in unexpected ways. So one of the most prolific relationships that does form in, in this period is this relationship between the punk scene and what I'll now call for shorthand the hip-hop scene. These are, <clears throat> these are groups that come from entirely different social backgrounds. The punk scene is largely, although not exclusively, made up of what we could call suburban middle-class white refugees, people fleeing the, you know, the far reaches of the United States, searching a life away from what they were called, they would have told me, described to me as being the nine to five drudgery of the kind of daily existence that they've seen their parents living. And they go to New York City to experience something different. Um, 
And one of the great sh startling developments of the period is the way that they form this relationship with the practitioners um, of the Bronx party scene. But what they do when they meet is they very quickly discover that they're speaking almost exactly the same language, even though the fact that one is coming back from, uh, comes from suburban, middle, white middle class America, and another comes from working class, black and Latino, um, New York City, and in particular the Bronx. They both speak the same language of cut up, of collage, of DIY, of intertextuality, of juxtaposition, of, and of recycling. So these are, you know, these are art effectively artistic and musical philosophies, but all of a sudden that the, the, the people involved in this culture realize that there's this convergence is, is taking place and that they have this, co this communication is going on. One quick example of this is, you know, the point when Dabby Harry and Chris Stein of Blondie um, with Fab Five Freddy, I believe, who's now on a previous slide, um, go up to the Bronx, sample this kind of Bronx party culture, and then record this track called Rapture, which has elements of punk, elements of disco, and elements of, of rap music. Uh, this, was a, this was released in, again in 1980. It's worth saying, I realize I'm running out of time here, so I'm, gonna, I'm trying to sort of speed through a few points here, but it's, it's what, it, what happens in this, in this moment is that all DJs effectively are playing across genre. You could be a punk DJ, you could be a DJ in the post-disco dance scene, or you could be, let's say, a hip-hop DJ. And yet, my, the, the simple contention of the, of the book is that if you went to hear any of these DJs play in any of these settings as a dancer, you would never know what style of record was coming on next. Larry LeVan would play music and genres same with David Mancuso, across the board. Bambata and the Bronx hip hop DJs were selecting from all sorts of different sounds that by no means were they just playing kind of rap music at, at this particular moment. And then punk DJs like Anita Sarko were playing everything from easy listening to Brazilian music and African music, um, you know, French African music. Um, so there was no, there was there was a general move towards openness and towards integration of discrete um, cultural expressions into this period. And so, although we tend to think of these DJs as being parts of different scenes, and although there were clearly some distinctions between these scenes, there were much more, there were many more connections between these scenes than than things that um, separated them. Um, it's in this scenario that genre, that music, sh I, shall I play just like a minute of music? Because I've been talking an awful lot. And people, you know, it's in this moment that genre implodes. Um, the, the music doesn't, the music that is still being released prolifically because, you know, people that there's never been more people going out dancing in New York City in, in early 1980 than any point maybe in, in the history of the city. So the DJs and the independent record companies, because the majors have disappeared, have got to feed these crowds. Um, but this, the mentality with which everyone is going into the, not only the DJ booths, but also the recording studios, is one of bringing different elements together. And so this is the point where music, it doesn't sound like disco, it doesn't sound like punk music, and you know, often rap music does, doesn't necessarily sound like rap music, or else we hear rap appearing in all sorts of unexpected places. The Tom Tom cover, you know, end up recording rap music. Blondie is recording rap music. So there's a great deal of mobility. And the music that is often is recorded uh, in this in this scenario doesn't obviously fit into any single genre. So I'll you know I'm sorry that this is kind of it's very hard to kind of try and say these things in, in a limited amount of time, even though I've been talking for a long while. But I'll just play one example of a track called "Go Bang" by the guy I wrote, uh, produced by the guy. I wrote the second book about Arthur Russell, the guy who kind of seemed to move well, who did in many ways move seamlessly between downtown's different music scenes. And I'll just say briefly, in recording this, this was actually the Francois Kevorkian remix of this record, but in recording this record, uh, Arthur Russell brought um, composer musicians into the studio, new wave guitarists, uh, and amateur percussionists that he had met in the loft, as well as a sort of solid grooving R&B rhythm section from Philadelphia called the Ingram Brothers. So it's kind of bringing, again, all of these discrete elements into a record. The original is actually even more kind of um, extraordinary than the version I'm playing, but this is the version that mainly got to be played in, in the clubs of the era. So I'll, I'll just let this run for a minute or so. Uh, uh, uh. 
goes on for a lot longer, of course. Um, but we have just a little hint there of some of the elements that are coming together. There's, um, you know, there's, it's, the, the groove is kind of, there's got a disco pace, but there's obviously clearly a funk and R&B element is coming through very strongly. We have ex the experimental musicians from the downtown compositional scene. We have Julius Eastman playing keyboards as if, you know, he's kind of fallen on the keyboards at certain points. It's Julius Eastman who's kind of singing the operatic vocal. And generally there's an app, we have kind of effectively some wrapped vocals come into the matrix. And it's an open, it's uh, an open beat structure, we have, you know, with kind of Latin percussion also coming to the fore um, that can can the captured the kind of this the loose and open and integrated spirit of 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 the of the moment. I'll play just very very quickly because I think we deserve a little bit of a break from kind of all the talking and I will try and then bring things to a close. Another track which kind of is symbolic of the way that, um, for example, punk music uh, and funk music and disco um, started to come together and in this moment uh, from bands that previously considered themselves to be punk bands, uh, but then also wanted to start making music that was more danceable. So we have this kind of sound which we could call punk funk, although that that name never really took any kind of, didn't take root during the period at all. So this is a track called Optimo by Liquid Liquid. another track I mean there's the thing is there are so many tracks that kind of bring together so many diverse elements it's a little frustrating to be able to only play snatches of the three but one of the other things that happens in this period is that and this, this is a major major development is that dub music effectively comes into New York City dance music for the first time again for reasons I'm not entirely clear about this has barely been written about but it was a huge phenomenon to bring in dub effects into the city at this point for me it's because of dub's sense of infinite potential in part is the reason it appealed this is what dance floors were feeling it, what they wanted music that continually had a sense of of bringing of, of of space and of openness i mean we could argue that no sound has expresses that more forcefully than dub and it's in this period that dub music comes in and also a whole range of electronic uh uh, instruments that are breaking through, including the Roland uh, 808 drum machine um, that goes on to later define house music, but it gets to be used on records, which I'm not going to have time to play, unfortunately, such as Planet Rock. Um, so added to disco and to punk and to rapping and to dub music, we also have a whole range of electronic sounds that come into being. You know, they've exist, synthes electronic synthesizers have existed before, but this is the point um, that they really start to um, break through into kind of pop music and dance music. So here we have the record produced by Larry Levan. This is unprecedented to have a DJ producing a record. Normally DJs, if they've had any involvement at all, are, re are remixing records. Larry Levan becomes the first DJ to join a band called the New York City Peach Boys. It's a rock band, but Larry Levan, this is the Paradise Garage DJ, for those who are not quite following all the different names, I know it can get a bit confusing at points. Larry Levan, as the Paradise Garage DJ, joining a rock band, brings dub and electronics into uh, the sound of that rock band, which also starts to integrate a very heavy soul, R&B, and disco aesthetic. So this is what that record sounds like. Uh, this is Don't Make Me Wait by the, by the Peach Boys. All right. 
So these are some, I've probably lost where I'm in the slideshow, of course, uh, but these are some examples of the kind of musical convergence. Uh, this, these are images of the fun gallery. Oh, sorry, this is, this is a Zulu Nation uh, DJ and dancer called um, Africa Islam, who's, this is his Paradise Garage uh, membership card, which I was supposed to show a little bit earlier. Anita Sarko, DJ at the Mud Club, who just plays the widest range of, of sounds uh, imaginable. And I, I understand that one of the DJs playing at Ace Hotel tonight is going to be drawing from one of the Anita Sarko playlists uh, in the book to kind of recreate Anita Sa an Anita Sarko set. Anita Sarko is one of these figures who tragically kind of died a couple of years ago. Grandmaster Flash and Tina Weymouth, the zoo, the Bronx party scene, and the kind of the, Tina Weymouth of the Talking Heads, part of this kind of p art punk phenomenon in downtown New York in the mid '70s, are suddenly kind of pictured together. They're collaborating on on sounds and in, and in spirit. Liquid Liquid, who were initially called Liquid Idiots, um, but then decided that their sound was getting too funk and disco and dance influenced for them to even have such a name as Liquid Idiot. Um, so they start to rename themselves. Uh, liquid liquid and this is arthur russell the guy who uh, the uh, composer cellist um, multi-instrumentalist songwriter and producer who wrote this this the first record i played um go bang um and this is interesting this is arthur this is i mean i'll just throw this in quickly planet rock is often seen to be this kind of classic rap founding electronic rap record that, uh, that goes on to be called electro but to me, it's interesting that Electro doesn't have a name in this period. None of these records that I've played have a name in this period. You can also read um, pretty much, I'm sure, every history of hip hop um, written so far. And in it, you won't see that one of the key influences that went into this record, Planet Rock, one of these foundational electronic rap records, was in fact the record I just played, Don't Make Me Wait which was kind of being generated by Larry Levan at the Paradise Garage. Uh, Arthur Baker was the producer of this record, Planet Rock. Up until this moment, most, most rap records that you heard would basically be loops of disco records or disco funk records with someone rapping over the top. But this wasn't how most disco and dance music was structured. Disco, for example, was absolutely founded on the idea of a journey and of crescendos that would peak the crowd. Rap music didn't really have any kind of crescendos at all. But if you listen to a record like Planet Rock, Arthur Baker says he wanted to have kind of dr dance music drama within this kind of record that also featured electronic sounds and rapping. And so it was Don't Make Me Wait, which was the biggest record in New York City at that particular point, that became one of these models for rap music. But we won't get to read about these connections uh, in the history books so far because they are, they in a sense break down some of the assumptions about how these histories are set separate rather than were uh, engaged in these unfolding interactions with each other in downtown New York City. So it's interesting. This music doesn't have a name in this period. People have been burnt by names. People have seen what's happened to kind of disco, for example, and the way that that kind of went wrong. And so we, the names that kind of go on to kind of come later, that come for this, this music, these sounds. In a sense, hip hop, which I've already talked about, which was barely in circulation. Electro came out of Britain at the end of 1983, even though a lot of the music we, that was coming out, we, we might now call electro. Um, Post-punk is this very popular a term now to describe a lot of the music that was coming out in this era but post-punk wasn't a term that was in circulation at all uh, sometimes it's called mutant disco uh, mutant disco was the name of an album in that era and it captures some things about this music but mutant disco also wasn't if you go through the archives and you look at the reviews no one no one had a name for these various sounds that were coming through um, at this particular period and no one particularly cared because it was a music that was being lived that was being sold like you know like hot cakes in the record stores and no one had a, a necessarily a reason to do anything different one of the other things that I'd kind of I'm, I'm bringing this to a close uh, one of the one of the things that's interesting to me about this period is you can hear the records and many many scores and scores of other records that are, you know carry similarly pluralistic features and you could go to a post-disco dance club, you could go to an art punk club, or you could go to a kind of what we now call a hip hop club. And to me, the interesting thing is that you could hear any of these records played in any of these settings. Yeah, the music traveled between these scenes. And because the music was uh, composite, was uh, pluralistic, was hybrid and mutant in its structure, 
it was able to move between these scenes. And as it moved between the scenes, it also encouraged people who are participating in these scenes to move between these scenes. Thus, the way we see all the Bronx guys going to the Paradise Garage, or we see all these meetings happening between the art punk crew and the um, uh, Bronx party crew. So why did, yeah, I'm going to close, but why did it happen? <laughs> it happened because New York City um, was, a, was a cheap place to live during this period. It was a melting pot of different peoples, poly, poly, you know, uh, multiracial and polysexual coming to live in the city. And it was also a period where, where the corporations decided to abandon the scene because there wasn't money to be made in it, because it was going to be hard to sell mutant hybrid explorative music to a national or an international music uh, audience. And so it was in this situation that this kind of what I call a virtuous economy kind of emerged in which seen the, the, it seemed as though this could carry on, this kind of scene could carry on forever because it was economically self-sufficient and it found a way of kind of uh, meeting everyone's social and economic needs within, a, within an environment that was increasingly open, community-based, uh, in, increasingly integrated. Um, so, you know, why, why didn't that happen? Um, there were, you know, three pretty terrible developments that came to, came to the fore primarily in 1983 and then became dominant in, in 1984. And just to kind of not get too depressing, I'll just kind of briefly reference them. Um, but they're a, they're a major part of kind of how things came to an end and, and then what happened next. So AIDS first gets reported in 1981, and it reached... I don't, I don't want to kind of belittle this by hurrying it, but I'm aware that I've gone way past the, the how long I was supposed to speak, so I'm sorry about that. AIDS uh, is first reported in 1981, and it reaches epidemic proportions in 1983. It wipes out a huge number of people who are participating uh, on in this downtown party scene, uh, many of them queers, but also people who are, you know, experimenting with drugs as, as well as that. So this is, AIDS is one element. C crack uh, reaches epidemic proportions in, in 1984. Um, so it follows hard on the heels of AIDS reaching um, epidemic proportions. And what I briefly want to say is that if you are, if you, if if one is living one's life in early 80s New York City, and the uh, and rents are cheap, and the partying is good, and you know, and the and the cost of living is cheap. This, these are the conditions that enable people to be open and to be relaxed about the way they live in the city and open to new experiences, which clearly is the only reason why all this hybrid culture comes into being in the first place, because people are experiencing life as a, in a way that enables them to kind of explore the unknown and to interact with the unknown. But in 1983 and 1984, through AIDS and crack, two of the major communities that are contributing to this scene, the, the queer community, and these are not exclusive communities, obviously, as well, but the queer community and the African-American community effectively come under attack. Ronald Reagan doesn't even mention AIDS until the kind of until he's pretty well at the end of his second term of office. And the welfare cuts that Reagan introduces in his first budget, as well as general hostility to the African-American community, means that queers, as well as the African-American community, are all of a sudden, through 1983 and 1984, on the defensive. And when you're on the defensive, you become closed. And so what we see is that culture changes very dramatically in 1984. For the first four years of the, of, uh, of the 1980s, culture is, as I've been describing it, endlessly. It's convergent, it's hybrid, it's plural, it's open, it's unpredictable. By 1984, there's only a couple of records in the, in, in the, the whole year that are released that have these qualities and that move between these discrete scenes. What actually ha what happens much more generally is the scenes become segmented, they become closed off. And although we could say this is still a very uh, productive and creative period in the, in the history of New York City, I'm not sure it was as productive and creative as the opening years of the 1980s, but clearly culture doesn't end. But what happens is the culture changes in 84, and it becomes much more linked to kind of... Uh, hardened sense of identities, often of communities that are, you know, becoming discreet and in some respects defensive. And the third element that kind of, you know, also transforms the culture and the city is this kind of the, 
the onset or the, the full manifestation, I think I should probably put it, of neoliberalism. So as I sort of said, you know, what seems like several days ago, um, <laughs> we could say that neoliberalism is born in 1975 when President Ford refuses to kind of give economic support to New York City and the city goes to the banks to get its bailout. But it's Reagan's first budget is, comes through in 1981. And it's in only in 1983, but very much in 1983, that Wall Street climbs by, I think it's something like 25% in one year, and real estate inflation also goes up 25% in one year. Before then, there was not much growth in the in the real estate market. There was not much growth on, in the in the in the stock market. But it's it's this bursting through of the stock market and of the housing market, which be, marks the transformation of the city into something like what we might call New York City of today, but we could also say London of today, San Francisco of today, almost any major kind of global city. And it's this trans it's these it's these reforms that were introduced around liberalization in particular um, around the kind of the getting rid of regulations that made banks behave in certain ways for example or made landlords behave in, and landladies behave in certain ways the results in, in in these cities changing and it's in this way that New York City becomes a more divided city. It becomes economically divided, and it also increasingly becomes a place where young artists can, can no longer afford to live. And because of the process of, of what we might call in shorthand gentrification, there's also this scenario uh, in which the city starts to regulate the party scene much hard, harder. Um, and that kind of reaches its, its own culmination um, with, Gilli with Giuliani's zero tolerance, which comes in um, around the early 1990s. So it's these three, th these three uh, developments around AIDS and around crack and, and neoliberalism that end, you know, that put an end to this kind of, this, this interesting dynamic and very open creative window that I've, I've attempted, you know, uh, to describe today. You know, it's, I never like ending in a depressing way. <laughs> it's very hard at the end of this talk to not end in, in a depressing way. But I, all I will just say, in, uh, to, to just kind of conclude, is that you know what we, what I've been experiencing, partly with the publication of this book, but it's clearly much, much, much broader than around the publication of this book, is a beginning or or the development of analysis of the world in which we live today, an understanding around some of the re, the relationship between the way cities have become structured and unlivable, and the way that culture can be made and experienced. And there seems to be this kind of growing groundswell of opinion um, of you know the the things that things need to be sort of changed and it's through you know I would hope you know very humbly that by kind of re-examining what was possible in cities before the onset of the neoliberal era that we can start to get an idea of how we might want to reorganize cities for the future I thank you for your patience <laughs> <clears throat>